Here, in the desert sun outside Tucson, Arizona, lie the remnants of over 6,000 American military aircraft. On its own, it represents the third largest air force in the world. Four of these machines are the last of nearly 1,000 Republic F-105 Thunder Chiefs built. Few remember its story or the sacrifice of the men who flew her. But in the 1960s, in the air war over North Vietnam, the Thunder Chief flew more missions and suffered more losses than any other American plane. 108 pilots died in Thunder Chief cockpits over Hanoi. Many were sent down in flames by Soviet-built SA-2 surface-to-air missiles. When these missiles first appeared in the skies over North Vietnam, it sent the United States Air Force into a tailspin. It was a big deal. Remember, a SAM is what got Gary Powers in the U-2. The missile was effective. It could reach you at most altitudes you flew at. And they were hoping that all they had to deal with in Vietnam was AAA, anti-aircraft artillery. And here we have a surface-to-air missile that can reach up to you. Summer 1965. In an age when military fighters have just begun to go supersonic, the SAM can travel two and a half times the speed of sound and reach over heights of 18,000 meters. In July, when an American F-4 Phantom is destroyed by one of the enemy missiles, commanders are forced to mount a counter-strike. Back in Washington, in a move that still infuriates those who flew the mission, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara details American strike plans one full week before the raid is launched. I hear yours too. Everybody wear your black belt today, guys. Within days, Thunder Chief pilots stationed at Korat Air Force Base, Thailand, are chosen for the mission. One of these men is 30-year-old Lieutenant Ray Moss. By the summer of 65, Moss has already put in 11 years of service and plans a long career in the Air Force. At that time, there were eight operational SAM sites in North Vietnam, but Mr. McNamara told the North Vietnamese we were going to specifically attack that one site and destroy it within one week. I flew over about two to 3,000 anti-aircraft guns that were shooting at everybody that came in. I felt that uh, probably the North Vietnamese had moved every anti-aircraft gun they had in that area. Going out, I flew over about a 10-mile area through the rice paddies that were dry, where the anti-aircraft guns were just set out about one per acre. They were not camouflaged, they were not bunkered, and they were just shooting the devil out of everybody. Right. Probably 30 or 40 airplanes hit the target. I was one of the later airplanes to, to get to the target. At 43, Captain Larry Guarino is one of the oldest Thunder Chief pilots flying. Even a novice in a duck blind, if enough ducks fly by, sooner or later he's going to hit one. And I was the unlucky duck that came by after the gunners had had a lot of practice shooting at airplanes. 
most of the POWs were 105 pilots. Most of the losses were 105s. The F-105 had the highest loss rate of any aircraft in the first part of the Vietnam War. It was a slaughter. Mayday, mayday. They were shot down, some ahead of me and some behind me. And I heard the calls, I heard the guys going in. You're all on the same radio frequency and you're hearing everything that's going on. Where is everybody? Ironically, the missile sites are not even there. The enemy has moved them, set up wooden decoys, and brought in hundreds of AAA guns to await the American attack. We're getting flat without the target on the watch. There was no missile equipment anywhere in the area. The North Vietnamese had taken telephone poles, painted them white, and propped them up with pine trees that they cut down to make it look like a missile site. In reality, Vietnamese ingenuity has little to do with the tragedy. Nearly 24 hours prior to the mission, American reconnaissance planes had taken photos revealing the trap. But leaders in Washington are unwilling to call off the strike after making it such a public affair. We had those photos. Those photos were in Washington. They were annotated as that was our target. And they were nothing but telephone poles. And 64 airplanes were sent in to annihilate those telephone poles. And we, we felt very disheartened to think we were going into a target where there wasn't even anything left but telephone poles to, to kill. And we lost six 105s on that mission. It was just the beginning of what would, for American pilots, be one of the most decisive episodes in history. The Thunder Chief's combat legacy begins months earlier. In March 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson launches an American bombing campaign over North Vietnam. The strikes are meant to pressure North Vietnamese leaders to cut off aid to Viet Cong guerrillas fighting in the South. Pentagon commanders codename the air assault Rolling Thunder and expect it to last no more than a few weeks. Instead, it becomes a deadly carrot-and-stick game that will last nearly four years and claim the lives of almost 1,000 American pilots and over 50,000 Vietnamese civilians. From the start, Rolling Thunder is marked by a series of bombing escalations and halts imposed by the President. Johnson's inner circle is certain that this slow squeeze will bring Hanoi to the bargaining table. To an air force that has the firepower to destroy any city at will, the idea of a limited war is hard to comprehend. All involved know that with a phone call from the president, Hanoi can be leveled in a single afternoon. Why then did American leaders show such restraint? Ask McNamara. Ask Johnson, of course he's dead now. I think uh, it's been accurately quoted that uh, Lyndon Johnson made the statement that them boys over there can't bomb an outhouse without I say so. Morning and welcome to TAC 4.3. One of the most difficult orders for the pilots to understand is the bombing restriction imposed upon surface-to-air missiles. The SAMs arrive by the boatful. North Vietnam's harbor city of Haiphong teams with Soviet ships unloading the tools of war. 
But for years, the vessels and docks are off limits to the Americans prowling overhead. Fearful of killing Russian advisers that accompany the SAMs, US pilots watch helplessly as they move to their assembly areas. They photographed them every day being loaded on trucks and hauled out in the countryside. They photographed them being set up in the jungles and the areas where they set them up. Now we could have knocked them out right then and been the end of the, the missiles, but that was never the case. We had to wait until they were operational and could shoot us down and then our leader, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara, would allow us to hit one site. And I know of instances over there after that where aircraft were coming home from a mission, a SAM site well, we didn't know about would pop up and shoot a missile at them. The aircraft would turn around and come back and strafe it or fire rockets or whatever you might have at the missile site. come back and report that and then they would put him in for a court-martial because that was not his target. The Joint Chiefs of Staff requested the Air Force to come up with a target priority list. We did 270 some odd targets. Order of priority 1 through 270. When they finally were approved they started at the bottom of the list and worked up to the most important over a two-year period. Added to this is a misguided command policy. The Thunder Chief is designed as a bomber, yet is asked to perform a fighter's task to disastrous effect. The Thunder Chief is a product of Cold War paranoia. Designed ultimately for the bringing of Armageddon. The jet is built to fly low and fast. Its Coke bottle fuselage, small wings and huge J-75 engine combine to create a machine that looks more like a dart than a plane. But like a dart, the Republic 105 will never be able to twist and turn as a great fighter plane should a shortcoming that will haunt Thunder Chief pilots in the years to come. Short wings on a long body do not make for a nimble machine. And the 105 is long, as long as the B-17 of World War II. But the Flying Fortress was flown by a crew of ten. The Thunder Chief seats only one. You gotta remember, for a lieutenant coming right out of flight training, going to something like the F-105, I mean, that makes one a heck of an impression on a guy thing was just huge and you couldn't even touch the wing so so big there was a reason for its size in reality it was a bomber designed with an internal bomb bay to carry a nuclear weapon deep into Eastern Europe and vaporize the smaller industrial cities of the region The F-105 was developed to fight a nuclear war. The tactical Air Command at the time had very little money, and the only way they could keep a piece of the budget was to participate in nuclear strategic weapon delivery. What they did is developed a large fighter that had an internal bomb bay that would carry basically a single nuclear shape. They developed it so that it would go very, very fast at low level possibly even supersonic, although that's very tough at low level. And the idea was to go in undetected, below the radar, open the bomb bay, deliver this nuclear weapon and get back out as fast as you could. I had never dropped a conventional iron bomb in my life until I was in combat. I had dropped some 25-pound practice bombs, but never a 750-pound boomer. First time I did was on the Tan Hoa Bridge in North Vietnam. We were really unprepared for that. 
you don't have to get too close with an atomic bomb. Five miles will do. You got to get pretty close with a, with a 500 pound bomb. One hundred missions to be flown. A hundred targets still unknown. But it's my belief that my thunder chief strikes a telling blow to help G.I. Joe. Okay, Detroit, uh, let's get out of here to the southwest. Till a hundred missions I myself have flown. Throughout 1966, an average of 400 bomb-laden American planes strike North Vietnam every day. The resources needed to maintain this cycle of destruction are enormous. Crown, uh, Waco uh, requests that you can, uh, in about 30 minutes, uh, move the tankers up north for them. Uh, Roger, we'll, uh, we'll move them up. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, come on, Sam. Come on. Under full afterburn, the 105 can use up its entire fuel supply in less than four minutes. Missions from Thailand to Hanoi and back can take nearly four hours. It required tremendously expensive tanker support to get anything done. We had fleets and fleets of KC-135s over Southeast Asia practically 24 hours a day offloading fuel. It used to mystify me how in the world they were getting that much fuel over there. Only five of every 100 missions are against fixed targets. The rest are interception strikes against the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a series of jungle paths leading from Hanoi to the south. The Vietnamese build countless secondary routes so that if one road is blocked, traffic can be diverted around the destruction. For many, the trip south takes nearly four months. Thousands die of malaria and dysentery along the way. One young soldier writes to his parents, I am crying whilst writing this letter to you. Our surrounding areas are mountains, and we cannot find anything to eat. Consider me dead. We take a $20 million fighter and launch it against a $4 bicycle and get shot down doing it. That's pretty insane. And that shows you a lot of what the 105 and the other airplanes were up against. It's hard. You can't win that kind of war because you're not going to be, uh, win a guerrilla war with technology. You're going to win it with guerrilla tactics. But we didn't do that. In Washington, Johnson and McNamara cling to the belief that the flow of supplies can be stemmed by the bombing campaign. When CIA officials protest that the bombing cannot succeed, McNamara shields LBJ from their dissent. These were not heavy modern military divisions, they certainly didn't have PXs and all those things that our troops have. So the amount of actual supplies necessary were not too much. Now, not all of these men have been infiltrated from the north, but an important number have been. McNamara was enthusiastic about numbers, that's for sure. But uh, the CIA, a friend of mine went to see him one time and said, you know, Mr. Secretary, in war, something more important than numbers, it's the spirit. We didn't, didn't understand. These were people who had been at war for generations, and many knew nothing but war. So the, the art of evading or destroying or harassing an enemy was a fine art to the North Vietnamese. So here we come with our technology. We're going to just bomb them back to the Stone Age, right? I remember General Jap saying, we were in the Stone Age. What were you going to bomb us back to? Over 600,000 northerners work in labor brigades to rebuild what American bombs destroyed. One of the most infamous points on the trail is the Mugai Pass, a crucial funnel through the mountains 
where tons of Chinese supplies are routed south. It is seen as a choke point. In one strike, 30 planes drop over 600 tons of ordnance on the twisting mountain road. The raid cost US taxpayers $21 million. Almost before the smoke clears, 150,000 workers descend on the pass. Two days later, the Vietnamese reopen the road. Soon, the intensity of the air campaign brings about a new problem. We ran out of bombs in a matter of two months in the latter part of 1965, early 66. The industrial base that generates bombs had been shut down because Department of Defense was not procuring anymore. They didn't need to, they had some stockpile they figured. And oh, by the way, we're never gonna fight a conventional war, so we don't need any of those. So let's sell them to Germany. The Pentagon had sold thousands of bomb casings to West Germany as scrap metal. The Germans paid $1.70 per casing and offered to sell them back at $21 a piece. There were days that we had eight airplanes and every plane flew with only one bomb because that's all we had. The F-105 would have carried eight bombs, it's each airplane, but we didn't have enough to load every airplane, so they put one bomb on each airplane and exposed eight guys uh, to the enemy fire uh, to get eight sorties in for a sortie count. Under Secretary McNamara's leadership, statistics take on absurd gravity. In support of this operation, there were 27 sorties flown yesterday. In the south, ground commanders demand ever-increasing fatalities. But for air commanders, the sortie reigns supreme. 23 sorties scheduled, and they will be flown early in the morning while the weather's good. Success and promotion rely heavily on each officer's ability to fly more sorties over the north than his peers. The region around Hanoi and Haiphong is called Route Pack 6. It's a feared destination. Here, pilots are 15 times more likely to lose their lives than anywhere else in Vietnam. Hanoi is bristling with guns aimed at the sky. Thousands are given rifles and encouraged to use them every time the air raid siren is sounded. It is as much a psychological tool as a military one, giving the people of the North a sense of empowerment and the ability to fight back. There were so many meatballs, as you call them, coming at you from the anti-aircraft guns, and I instinctively ducked behind the shield in the cockpit, and of course I was at a very low altitude at the time, and and I said, hey, dummy, you can't fly the airplane with your head down here, get it back up. And I stick it back up and they're still shooting at me. And I ducked a second time and I said, no, no, I got to look out. And I steeled myself and stuck my head back up and flew right into the guns to attack them. By the end of 1966, nearly one of every five Thunder Chiefs built had been blown to bits in the skies above North Vietnam. Pilots of other aircraft soon nicknamed the 105 the Thud. It's a brutal joke. The noise that the jet supposedly makes as it crashes into the Vietnamese countryside. Later, the term is sanitized to mean the sound made when the heavy plane touches down. Drugs and heavy drinking bouts ease the mounting tensions.
We flew hard, we played hard, and we lived hard at that point. Not trying to be anything, any kind of image or something like that. It just, it just worked that way. You know, you release a lot of attention by doing that, and we, we'd do all sorts of stuff. I can remember one time getting the big brawl. Three lieutenants took on this big major, and we just, just goofing off, and we cleaned the whole bar out. I mean, we broke chairs, tables, and everything, and the, the COs just sitting there watching the whole thing. And when it was all over with, there was beer and glass and broken tables, and and he just sort of folded his arms, looked down, and he said, "Lieutenants, y'all having a good time?" We looked up. We didn't even know he was there, and we said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "Good." I'll be back in about 20 minutes. Just make sure this place is all cleaned up and you pay the damages. That's all I said. 100 missions to be flown. 100 bridges to be blown. On my left and right, the rest of my flight help keep me alive in my 105. Till a hundred missions I myself have flown. Captain Roger Ingvelson had almost finished his tour when his 105 went thud. I had 87 takeoffs and 86 landings. <laughs> I was probably around 50 feet strafing with a 20 millimeter cannon in the F 105 at trucks, and I felt this explosion, so I knew I was hit. My cockpit filled with smoke, I pulled up, I blew the canopy off so I could see, and pulled up in a steep climb. My control cables had burned out, and I lost control of the aircraft. I was starting to roll, and it started to roll back down, and figured around 700 feet, I had to do something fast. And all the training we had for ejection seat training and ejections, you don't even think about that. I got a hold of that handle and squeezed that trigger and out I went. An emergency beeper goes off and we pick it up. It's on a special frequency and you can hear it in your headset. Don't get out here, baby. That was a real hit for me. I mean, I, 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 it really hit me what the reality of all this was about because you couldn't help them. You couldn't do a thing. It's so close to Noi. All the, the North Vietnamese, of course, were all over the place, and so you couldn't go in. So we just had to leave our buddies behind. That was tough. I was knocked out by the wind blast, and I came to just before I hit the ground, and I expected to be all broken up. I didn't have a bruise, not a bruise. I pulled out my portable radio to call my wingman who was circling overhead, just to tell him that I was okay, but I just tried to, tr started to transmit. I heard his rifle shot go off from behind, and here was this little kid, probably 10 years old, with a rifle. As a very confident fire pilot, who you, you figured you were on top of the world, you've lost that, and you're on the bottom. You're in a situation where you're scared, the adrenaline is pumping, and uh, you just try to think about survival. For the airman shot down, the most dangerous time is immediately after capture. Not all those taken prisoner make it to the prison camp. On one of my earlier missions, uh, one of the pilots was shot down, and he bailed out. Upon landing, the pilots flying over him at that time could see the villagers run out to him. And he was uh, taken. And then the next day, Hanoi Radio announced that the angry villagers had run out and killed the pilot, uh, that they were so mad that they, with their pitchforks and shovels and sighs and all, they beat the man and punctured him and killed him. The Vietnamese had good reason for anger. The Pentagon itself admitted that 1,200 civilians are dying every month in rolling thunder raids. 
so I didn't have to look at them. I didn't get, have to get close enough to get their blood on me and see them in the eyes when I was shooting and things like that. It was very impersonal. I mean, it was, I knew there were people down there. And I knew that, that there were people trying to shoot, kill me and I knew that uh, they were killing the hell out of American citizens. Most 105 pilots shot down, like Ingvelson, are taken to the Hoa Loa prison, also known as the Hanoi Hilton. I went there first, I think everybody did, and uh, I spent my first 20 months in strict solitary confinement. I didn't have any contact with anyone. Two years before Ingvelson's arrival, POW Larry Guarino endures an agonizing year and a half of solitary confinement. 18 months chained alone in a tiny cell. These are sketches from Guarino's private collection. Ranking officers are repeatedly beaten and interrogated. The Vietnamese hope that they will make public statements against the bombing or provide them with details of American tactics. When they got you down and you can't take any more torture or punishment, they like to use the word, have you surrendered? You say, yeah, I've surrendered, I've surrendered. That's the time to start lying, you see? That's the time to start really bullshitting them really heavily, because they don't know the difference. Sticking to name, rank, and serial number in the long run doesn't really work. So what you have to do is you have to invent a story. I would manage to screw the tapes up pretty good. Like, uh, and they said, uh, how did you get shot down? And I said, I didn't really get shot down. I said, I was just a replacement pilot, wasn't qualified to fly combat. And uh, they got a hold of me and, and wanted me to uh, fly this airplane because they were short of pilots. And I followed some captain up there because I couldn't see very well and, or, and I couldn't hear because I was, I'm the oldest guy up there, you see. And so when I got near the target, the engine just crapped out and I had to jump out of the airplane. I made up a story like that. But by 1967, Guarino's wild claims are frighteningly close to the truth. 105 pilots become so scarce that refueling tanker pilots are soon funneled into Thunder Chief cockpits. There's a certain body of things we call experience that you just got to have been there and you got to have done it enough, even in a peacetime environment just to the range, you need to go to the gunnery range enough times to feel the airplane and to feel what you're doing. You can't come out of a tanker and in five months be trained to be an F-105 pilot to replace somebody that's been flying fighters for eight, nine years. You don't want to go. I mean, you're asking for disaster. There ain't no way. There ain't no way. Many Thunder Chief pilots reckon it's statistically impossible to reach the 100 mission mark. We look at it over there that we had three ways out of Vietnam, and one was to be shot down and killed, the other was to be shot down and captured, and the other one was to be court-martialed. And none of the three were desirable, but one of the three was inevitable, and it really didn't matter which one because one wasn't any worse than the other. It's somehow you just develop an acceptance of guys are here today, they're gone tomorrow. 45, 44. Right, 45. 45. As disillusionment grows, the 100 mission mark turns from a matter of pride to one of survival. One for the month. 99 hard ones to go. It became too important. I even have a hat where each time I flew a mission, I'd make a mark on the brim of that hat. It wasn't something I was doing out of patriotism or desire to save these people or do this, that, and other. I mean, I might have had some different feelings about it before I went over, but once I got there and I saw what was going on, yeah, I began to say, well, I need to get this old Georgia boy's ass back to his family and as close to one piece as I can I am, I'm not going to do my job any less. It's just that I'm not, I'm not over here, over you know. I'm not over here till we win the war and we go home like any other continent because we weren't at war. We were at politics. President Johnson and Mr. McNamara, 
They were using bombers to send messages. I mean, please, dear God, if you want to send a message, put it in an envelope. Don't use a bomber. If you, want, if you use a bomber, use it to bomb. That's what it's for. Although a military debacle, there was still room for acts of bravery, as shown by Lieutenant Dave Waldrop. Gee whiz, I hear you got two MiGs. How'd you do that, sir? I guess I was pretty lucky. Came off the target, broke the right, which was pretty brief, to join up the flight. And then uh, after coming around the right, I looked over and I saw a 105 with two MiGs on his tail. The lead MiG is so close that he almost looked like he was in close trail formation. And he's shooting at the 105. I mean, the fire's coming out of the MiG's nose. And, and I, just, I knew this guy was within seconds of being knocked down. And I'm looking at the picture trying to decide what to do. Well, I had a sidewinder, which is our version of the heat seeker. Well, the missile sees a heat source, and it starts growling. And it's letting me know, I'm looking at something. I can go if you want to turn me loose. I'll go, and I'll get one of these airplanes. But the that blame MiGs was so close to the 105, with that big old J-75 engine putting out all this thrust that I was afraid that the sidewinder might be looking at the 105. So I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't live with the possibility of that happening. So I just reached over, turned the volume off on the, on the sidewinder so I wouldn't have to listen to it. And I started shooting. Then I realized how fast I'm going and how slow they're going. Because I shot by them at so fast it'd make your head spin around. And so I'm just sailing through this thing. And I go popping through this overcast. I roll upside down. I'm sitting up there hanging from the strap. And I'm cussing myself. Here you are, Lieutenant. You got one shot at a MiG in your life, and you blew it. By that time, out from underneath this overcast, here comes a MiG-17. He's got his afterburner going. And the other guys didn't have their afterburners going when I passed him. And so. I just pulled the nose down real slow, rolled out, and when I fired that cannon that we have, it fires 6,000 rounds a minute, 20 millimeter. It went right through the airplane. In fact, it went through the cockpit. Unbeknownst to me, it was so intense up there, and this sort of give you a little bit of idea how things work in combat. When I'm sitting there pulling my trigger, I'm hitting the MiG. The flashes, I mean, the you can see, see every bullet hitting the MiG. A 105 went right between me and the MiG. I never saw it. The MiG poses a lethal challenge to American airmen but the sophistication of Vietnamese ground defenses is truly shocking. By 1967, over 200 SAM sites dot the landscape, and more than 5,000 missiles will be launched against incoming American planes. Seeing SAM launch the airplane is probably one of the scariest things that can happen. And uh, we called these kind of missions white knucklers where you were tested to your utmost. As the missile came toward you, you lowered the nose of the airplane, picking up speed because the missile flew an intercept course. That is, it tried to go to a place in space out in front of you. And as you move the nose of the airplane down, the missile you could see adjusting to try to get out ahead of you. And at the instant that was just right, he pulled back on the stick, and the missile could not compensate for the new impact point in space that it had to get to, and it would effectively miss your airplane. To confront the new challenge, America creates an aircraft built to carry out a new kind of mission. They call it the Wild Weasel. Its specified job is to fly alongside American planes identify and ferret out enemy SAMs along the way. The two-seat F-105G is the first machine specifically designed to destroy enemy ground missiles. Here, the rugged, fast Republic jet comes into its own. 
The weasel slogan is, first in, last out. Soon, 105Gs precede each strike sortie north. The thuds loiter until all planes have pulled off target. They then serve as a rear guard when they head home. In the back seat sits the bear, the electronic warfare officer. It falls to him to pinpoint the enemy and direct America's new radar-guided Shrike missile onto the enemy radar van that controls the SAM missile complex. IPRF, we're in the beam, Jim. All it has to do is sniff a radar. That's all it needs, a radar emission. And it will ride down that beam to the radar dish that's emitting the beam. Passive, it can't be countered unless you shut the radar off. And the Vietnamese learned to do this, we call it a blinking. They would blink the radar, go to standby, kept the radar warm, but the dish wasn't emitting anything. And so the, the missile went dumb. And they would try to leave it off long enough for the missile to go hit the ground somewhere, or go off, veer off far enough to not hit the side, turn it back on. Uh, so it forced the North Vietnamese to be blind. It was a chess game where life was on the line and there probably was no closer example of the medieval joust than those two guys going at each other. Before long, weasel pilots possess new ordnance, the AGM-68. The missile has both a larger warhead and greater range than the Shrike. The weapon marks a turning point but comes too late for the 120 Americans downed by SAMs during rolling thunder. In all, nearly 1,400 Americans are killed or go missing in the bombing campaign over North Vietnam. One third of the aircraft downed are F-105 Thunder Chiefs. The losses yield little. By the end of 1968, Hanoi is no closer to compromise than it was three years earlier. To many, it is clear that American might has been useless against Vietnamese ingenuity. Back in the US, Secretary of Defense McNamara turns against the bombing campaign he once so strongly advocated. Mr. President, <coughs> I cannot <coughs> find words to uh, express what lies in my heart today. <coughs> and I think I'd better respond on another occasion. When McNamara's private criticisms turn public, he's quietly shifted from the Pentagon to the World Bank. Johnson replaces him with Clark Clifford, who the president thinks hawkish on the war. But Clifford too recommends an end to the air campaign. Rolling Thunder closes on November the 1st, 1968. But for Thunder Chief pilots like J.C. Hartney, the end comes too late. When my best friend was killed, that was one of the things that prompted me to go ahead and leave the Air Force with 12 years of service in. And I felt that there was no point in dying for a country that didn't care and that had no intention of ever winning the war. I was there because I was a soldier and I was sent. That's the simple, easy answer and the easy way out. I, I have other feelings about it, but that's why I was there. Whether we should have been there or not, as a citizen of the United States, hell no. Despite their bitterness, many Thunder Chief pilots flying in Southeast Asia request a second tour of duty. Tony Cushenberry was one of the first to complete 100 missions over North Vietnam. Now, you say how stupid I am when I said that I had volunteered to go back for a second tour. Yeah, and I had done that because I still was a soldier and I felt that uh, if they're going to keep on doing this, they need somebody with my, kind, my experience and my kind of 
uh, background at least somewhere in the mix over there that you know I can put me in and I may make a difference to somebody not to the effort nobody was going to make a difference to the effort because there was no effort <laughs> there wasn't any until we started trying to get us out of there and getting our POWs out that became our mission then that became our purpose for being there was getting the hell out of there 100 missions to be flown It's good to know you're not alone. Two weeks before Christmas, Dave Waldrop reaches the magic number. His tour of duty is over. One pilot story. 100 missions out of nearly a quarter of a million flown by Thunder Chief pilots during the Rolling Thunder campaign. To have survived, gotten out without getting shot down, without getting hurt, I was very, very satisfied with having reached that plateau. I mean, if I go to war, I'm going to want to fly an airplane that's durable. We would have lost far more people, dead or captured, if they hadn't been flying 105s those first several years of the war. If it had been some other jet, it would have been a different story. The Thunder Chief flew 75% of the missions over North Vietnam. The landscape of Southeast Asia is still rutted from the combat of three decades past. And the soldiers remain forgotten warriors from a struggle that grows dimmer in the American memory with each passing year. Though, as with all conflict, there will always be scars. I can sit here and try to describe to you all day long what it's like to be cruising along at about 600 knots and all of a sudden you want to go straight up, you just pull the stick back and all of a sudden you just are, you're gone, you're out of there. It's, it's, it's special. This, these men got to do that. I'm a thud pilot. I love my plane. It is my body. 